So the home is turnkey. Mm -hmm. You do not have to spend any upfront dollars in doing major renovations. There might be some projects that you want to do to help customize your home, make it your own, add a little character back in, but nothing that is urgent that needs to be done right away. So you can be saving thousands of dollars upfront on not having And I, I think the important part of this conversation, I think that that's hard for a lot of people, is like there's a difference between being a mortgage payer and being a homeowner. Welcome to the DFW New Home Podcast, the podcast where two realtors and new home experts share their insights on the exciting journey of buying and building new construction homes. We know that buying a new home can be daunting, but we're here to make the process more approachable, informative, and enjoyable. Our goal is to empower you with knowledge and resources to help you make informed decisions about your dream home. Mm. Whether you're a first time home buyer or an experienced homeowner, the DFW New Home Podcast is the podcast for you. Join us every week for insights, inspiration, and a little bit of fun on your journey to building your dream home. It, it's time. So I'm not, I'm not going to spoil it, uh, but if you missed the previous episode, you need to go back and listen because there was a major announcement. So I'm not going to spoil <laughs> that. We're just, we're, but we're going to run straight forward. And if you missed it, you need to go back and hit it. Uh, but Megan, today we're talking uh, hidden cost and hidden savings when buying a new home. So I think this will be a good one. Yeah. Buying a new home, buying any home. Cause I think a lot of people just think about, okay, I'm paying rent right now. When I buy a mm -hmm. home, I'm going to be paying a mortgage, right? But there's a mm -hmm. lot of associated costs with home ownership that it's also really important to consider. And a lot of savings that come along with going the new construction route to consider as well. Yeah. So do you want to start, well, you want to start with costs or you want to start with savings? What, what do you feel better about? So let's talk with some of the automatic savings that come mm. with new home construction versus yeah. old. Things Give are just built one. into the package. Yes. First one. Here we go. Oh, so the first one is going to be your energy bills. So especially if you're in an older apartment or an older home, like if you're already a homeowner and you're living in an older home right now, yep. you are likely going to be saving significantly on your utility bills. So yeah. go ahead. And no, I know. And I was just saying that that's a, that's one that's like, I think is always a surprising conversation, at least that I have with clients is like mm -hmm. when we're talking about affordability, you know, you know, usually it comes up as like, Hey, well, what are you paying in electricity? And I always, and I always show them my, like our electricity bill. So we bought a Same. new home, you know, three years ago and I'm like, Hey, here's, here's what ours is like. And there's all, it's always a, a like sticker shock in a good way of like, Oh, yeah. I didn't realize <laughs> that we were going to save that much. I mean, I, I have people telling me like, Oh, we're spending four five, six hundred $600 a month in the yeah. summer for, you know, for an apartment or for a house or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, we haven't gotten above 250. Yeah, we we're in about 2000 square foot, foot right now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, even in the summer, we don't really go over 200. That's changed yeah. a little bit since we got an electric vehicle. But the past two years that we were here before that, yeah, the, the bills were great. Like you, you will likely save at least 100 $200 per month on your electric bill. And, and a lot of that plays out just because, you know, building quality, you know, building material has gotten better. So these homes, you've got mm -hmm. thicker insulation or maybe you've got spray foam insulation. You've got a thicker like paned window, which is helping mm -hmm. and just a more energy efficient system. So that that helps a ton as versus like sense. something that's, you know, 10, 15, 20 years old, whatever. Yep. I'll All never, right. we'll, you know, we'll talk real quick about energy. I'll never forget my first, uh, one of my first apartments, we were living in Phoenix, Arizona. It was a 700 uh -huh. square foot apartment. And I had one summer, I had a $900 electric bill. Uh, mm, no. I, I about passed out. I was like, this is no, stupid. I hate everything. No, uh, thank so you. Energy, energy <laughs> efficiency is, is one of my love languages. I appreciate that to no end. Yeah. Because there are way more things that I would rather spend my money on than yeah. sending it off to the electric company. Well, and two, when you when you start putting that in perspective, it also shifts your total. Like when we talk about monthly payment, right? It's like, oh, yeah. you know, we're we're calculating based on this, and it's like, well, mm -hmm. if I can cut your electric bill in half, you know, that helps on your monthly payment, at least in the not necessarily the qualifying side, but like the the mental calculation of, hey, how much yeah. money is coming in versus how much can we spend? Yeah, because typically new construction homes, the purchase price is going to be a little bit higher. Yep. Um, that's why a lot of people will go to a pre-built home thinking, okay, that's going to save me money. Mm. But 
when you add your electric bill and your mortgage, it might be comparable to your electric bill and your mortgage in new construction. Yeah. So electric bill, let's talk about another like variable cost that uh, people don't consider. Let's talk about insurance. Yeah. So homeowner's insurance is actually lower with new construction because everything is brand new under mm. warranty. Um, same thing goes with if you're buying an older home, you better have some emergency savings set aside for when the water heater goes out one weekend or your AC bites the dust in the middle of the summer because it's 25 years old. Mm. You know, <laughs> like yeah. these, are, these are savings and costs on both sides of the equation. Right. Well, and, and the hard part about that, too, and we can we can talk about the builder warranty. Um, so, you know, like when you buy a resale home, we always get a home inspector, whether it's new or whether it's resale. And the inspector is going to show up on a resale home and say, oh, yeah, the, the air conditioning is functioning and it's working the way it should. But they can't predict that it's going to go out in six months. Right. And so I've had clients before where we've bought a resale home and everything looked great on the inspection. You know, nothing was found. And six to eight months later, uh, the water heater's out or the uh, the AC's out. And they're like, what do we do? And it's like, I'm sorry, you're you're kind of stuck like yeah. versus at least on a new side, you know, a, it's a brand new system, so it shouldn't fail. And B, if it does fail, you have that builder warranty to, to fall back on. Yeah, absolutely. And I know in general for new construction, like we always hesitate giving out exact numbers. So please just take us with a caveat that, <laughs> you know, it's not, it may not equate to your yep. actual payment, but what we use for estimates whenever we're trying to estimate what your mortgage payment is going to be, including taxes and insurance, mm -hmm. the number that we use for new construction homes is $90 a month. So yeah. you might find something a little bit more than that, but that's the number that we use when we're doing estimates. Yeah. And the good thing about that is you can shop it, right? So you're not, you're not, yeah. and like I said, yeah, please take that as an estimate and a grain of salt. Um, because <laughs> neither one of us have our insurance license, so we're not selling insurance. So, um, so that, that is not something I want to do either. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're talking energy efficiency. We've talked insurance. Let's talk. What about like upfront savings? Yeah. So the home is turnkey. Mm -hmm. You do not have to spend any upfront dollars in doing major renovations. Um, there might be some projects that you want to do to help customize your home, make it your own, add a little character back in, but nothing that is urgent that needs to be done right away. Um, so you can be saving thousands of dollars up front on not having to paint the whole house or redo the flooring or get new appliances right. because <laughs> everything is from the 90s. Yeah, or or earlier than that. Yeah, you know, earlier. It, it's kind of, it's kind of that now. it's kind of that feeling of like, hey, it's the difference of of a uh, of problem versus canvas, right? Like on an older home, you probably have some problems that have to be fixed. On a new home, you have a canvas that you get to paint and, you know, literally and figuratively of, hey, make this your own. Um, and you don't have to spend that money right away, but you get to spend that money and do things to make it, you know, your own. What? But even more so than that, as we talk about like, we talk about builder incentives. I want to get in on this a little bit. Ah, yes. It's because builder incentives for me, um, I think are the secret sauce of why one of the reasons why I love new construction so much is because there's not there's some some savings on those upfront costs as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Saving the best for last here. <laughs> so mm -hmm. typically builder incentives are going to show up in one of four ways. I've seen some other creative things, but typically you're either going to get something like flex cash, which mm -hmm. is something you could use. For instance, towards your closing costs, towards a rate buy down, maybe even to lower the cost of the home. There are design incentives. So if you're building from scratch, you might yep. get some dollars to put towards your upgrades. Um, and then rate buy downs, like instead of flex cash where, hey, you could use this for either or, they might be offering mm -hmm. just a straight up, hey, we're going to buy down your rate. Um, mm -hmm. Last thing that I see uh, builders throwing in, especially at more of a starter home price point, is things like a fridge, washer and yep. dryer, blinds. Um, so those are usually the four kinds of incentives that you'll see builders giving out at any any point. My my personal favorite is the flex cash. I mm -hmm. would much rather uh, like because everybody's situation is different, right? You know, depending on yeah. you know where we're coming from, what we're doing. Like, I would much rather just have the flex cash and be able to go talk to the lender and say, "Hey, here's the, here's the pool of money we have. Give me three options." Um, yeah. 
of, of how we can spin that, right? Because on one hand, it's like we could do lower interest rate, but higher closing costs. On the other hand, we could do higher interest rate, but lower closing costs, right? And so for me, that's, I think that's my favorite way when builders do it like that of like, hey, you have 15, 20, 25,000 in flex um, mm-hmm. to, to spend however makes the most sense for your situation. Yeah. Do you have more money saved up front and you want that payment to be lower? Okay. Well then use it to buy your rate down. If you're like, no, I'm a little cash poor up front and I can mm-hmm. still afford the monthly payment at the at the normal market interest rate, then go that route and have your closing costs taken care of. So that's well, especially that, great for a first time buyer to get in. And that's the thing too, is it is it is I'm a numbers nerd. Like I love seeing the numbers. And so for mm-hmm. me, it's like when I can when when we can lay it out and say, hey, buy, you know, buying a five and a half percent rate is going to cost you, is going to, you know, cost this much and it's going to be this much monthly, but taking the 6% rate is going to, is only going to cost you. It's it's oftentimes for me, it's surprising how little that payment changes when we move incrementally, but it significantly reduces the cash to close. So like in my mind, I want to do the math of like, Hey, if it's, if, if I'm swinging $10,000 one direction and it's only changing my payment by, let's say $150 a month, mentally for me, I want to say $10,000 divided by 150. How long is it going to take me to pay that back? And I would Mm -hmm. much rather take the like lower cash to close and spend a little bit more monthly that again, that's personal, but you know, every, everybody plays the game a little bit differently. I always try and tell people like, I want control of the asset for as little of my money as possible. Mm -hmm. Well, and especially if you are a first time buyer, this Mm -hmm. is your first house you're statistically not going to be staying there for that long. Nope. Two, three, five years max. Five so, at the max at this point. <laughs> yeah. So you have to do the math on that and say, okay, if it's going to take me this long to reap the benefits of that monthly savings, but by the time that pays for itself, I'm going to be looking to move up to my second home. Mm-hmm. Is it worth it? Or is it more, is it better to keep that $10,000 in your pocket? Right. And then you have to talk about too, like the scenarios of a permanent buy down versus a temporary buy down. And we could talk, I could talk for days on that. We probably need to get a lender in here and do that one. But yeah. again, it, it's all dependent on your situation and, and how it's, it's two things. It's situational dependent and it's what you believe is going to happen in the market. That's, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of interest rate, if you believe one thing, this is what you do. If you believe yeah. it, like, and it's so dependent, mm-hmm. I will say you, the full, no and then you <laughs> yeah. N- yeah. No. Cause let's be real. If we had crystal, if I had a crystal ball, I would be on the beach. I would not still be selling houses. Um, <laughs> but you know, that's for another day. I will say on the back end, kind of sharing a little bit, you were talking about the fourth incentive and the fourth incentive was like a uh, washer dryer blinds, blinds. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, ju- just to be clear on that. Um, they are not buying you a high end washer dryer mm-hmm. fridge. Uh, this is like base level. So I always, this is kind of one of those things, like think of this, like the sprinkles on the cake, like, it's nice, but it's not like you're not getting to pick it. You're, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to be anything fancy. So if you need it, take it. But I would much rather you get more incentive money. And I would rather have blinds over washer dryer fridge because in my mind, blinds are a pain in the butt. Like yeah. as somebody yeah. who didn't like we as somebody who didn't take the blinds from the builder and I was like, no, I'm going to do it myself mm-hmm. and didn't realize like that you have to measure your windows in three different spots uh, because mm-hmm. you get three different measurements. Uh, and I had to reorder several sets of blinds because I mismeasured. In hindsight, I should have just taken the builder's blinds. But I would much yeah, rather have that's... blinds over washer, dryer, fridge. Because like I said, you can go get that. Like pick the one you want because the builder's just going to get the, honestly, it's the cheapest one that they can get. Yeah. Blinds are always something I recommend you add on. But when people are like, oh, can I get your fridge or washer and dryer through you guys as well? I'm like, you know, you're probably better off. Like go get a Black Friday deal and you can pick. Yeah, exactly Black Friday, you. Craigslist, Nebraska Furniture yep. Mart. Uh, but don't do it so, until you close. Please no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, don't finance no, major no purchases. No lines of credit okay. open until we close on, on okay. that house. Uh, yeah. But yeah, flex cash, I mean, honestly, is the way to go. Also, can we talk for a second? So a lot of these builders advertise different rate promos and it's like two, one buy down. It's like, oh, your first year is this. And then you start reading the fine print and it's like, oh, it's only one house in that neighborhood. Or it's, hey, we bought into a pool of money and there's only so much available. And so it's not, I don't want to call it bait and switch, but it is like, there is some fine print that goes into that. So let, let, can we talk about that for a yeah. second? Or for instance, like, hey, uh, you can get this interest rate, but only if you're doing FHA 10% uh-huh. down. So yes, that is something that 
usually, even if even if the advertised incentive is not the exact incentive that you are able to get, there's still money there yep. for you to use. So yep. take it with a grain of salt when you see the advertised rate and just know like you may not be getting that exact rate, but you can still get a good deal. Correct. Those are designed to get you in the door to start the conversation. And again, you're still going to get great incentives. You just like, there's some stipulations on those as well. I would say the other stipulation, probably a lot of people aren't, aren't aware of is oftentimes they're tied to the builder's lender. So, uh, yes. most, bu most builders either a have a in-house lender that they have partial ownership in or B have a preferred lending partner that they have relationship with. Um, and when they say, Hey, here's your incentive money. Oftentimes they will tie that to use of that lender. There is, there is, you know, circumstances where you say, Hey, if, you know, we've got 25,000 in flex and they'll tell you, Hey, well, 10 of that is open to any lender. So like if you find another lender, uh, you know, you can have 10 of the 50 or 10 of the 25 or whatever. Sometimes you can write the contract to where you can get majority of the money. It just depends. But most of the time they're going to tie that with their in-house lending team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and that's and me, because like we don't have to give those incentive dollars for you to use the lenders that you know builders like working with but um i'm still <laughs> like adjusting my terminology but yeah, yeah like the, okay. the builder does not have to give you that money they do it because it makes the transaction way smoother for everybody involved so if you are saying hey i still want that money even though i'm going with an outside lender you're like well it's not, it's not giving us any peace of mind that we know the lender that you're working with, the communication Correct. is really strong. So like, that's why you can't just take that exact same incentive and apply it to any lender. Correct. And two, it's, it's really, it's like moving money on y'all side of the equation, right? It's, you know, mm -hmm. five plus one, uh, five plus zero is five, four plus one is five, two plus three is five. Like it just, it's moving money on the builder's side of the equation to help get you to the place that makes sense, like for you to buy. Right. And so also, a minute ago, you, you brought up blinds and yeah. like you, just, you decided to skip on the blinds because you were going to do them yourself. So yep. I think that's another really good transition to talk about what sort of things, if you're building from scratch and you're picking everything out, what sorts of upgrades should you spend the mm. money on and just have it taken care of versus yeah. things that can be for later to save a little money up front? I would say to start it off, uh, spend money on any sort of structural upgrade that you want that is offered with the builder. Mm -hmm. Things that can't cannot be changed or would be very difficult to change. Like you're not adding a third car garage uh, in yeah. three years. Like it's just not happening. So or the front elevation. Make sure yep. you like that front elevation if you're getting to pick it. Yeah. Don't settle. If you, <laughs> if you want a powder bath instead of a closet, or you want you know a study instead of a bedroom, or you want a different kitchen configuration, anything that changes the structure of your home, like those are those are priority number one in my book. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, beyond that, any of the really big ticket items that are a huge pain to have to go through, like you would have to do a renovation and yeah. live through um, that. The flooring. Floor, flooring is one. Well, flooring is one to an extent. I would say if you if you love what the builder is offering, like unless you know you have a specific floor in mind and it's only and like the builder doesn't offer that, then go base level because you know you're going to rip it out. I've had people do that where they're like, okay, let's just do carpet and tile and we'll rip it out. And we'll do the exact flooring that we want later. But that is a big upfront cost yep. and probably want to do it before you move in. So that's definitely yep. a thing I've had people do, but the majority of my buyers don't want to sign up for that level of project renovation immediately yeah. after closing. The, then the other things I would say would be like your kitchen. So your cabinets and your countertops, get those right. Yep. Um, so flooring, kitchen, like kitchen configuration, kitchen countertops, kitchen cabinets, and like ba master bathroom configuration. I think yeah. are the things that that really matter the most for me. Hundred um, percent. The biggest things that I used to tell people whenever I was leading them through the design process would be light fixtures, plumbing fixtures, hardware. Mm -hmm. Unless you see something that the builder has that you just love, mm -hmm. just just go with the standard and swap That's it out right. for exactly what you want later. Oh yeah, because it's it's so funny because it's like so this is kind of a twofold thing for me like so ceiling fans. Um, you know, we live in Texas. It's hot. I think every room should always have a ceiling fan. That's a personal opinion. 
But yeah. builders sell ugly ceiling fans. Let's just we'll call that what it is. And or yeah. or the ones that the ones that aren't ugly, they charge way too much money for. So I mm -hmm. want you to make sure that you get the like block and wiring to mount a ceiling fan. But go to Home Depot and spend 150 bucks a fixture and get what you want. Uh, so yeah. that that's one uh, cabinet hardware. Like everybody, you know, everybody's yes. like, well, why doesn't the cabinet have pool, like pools and handles? It's like because, because it costs eight to fifteen dollars for a two dollar pool when you go through the builder. That's why. Yeah. Like we did ours through Amazon and I think, I don't even know, but it was cheap and everybody yeah. like there's a thousand different drawer pools. And so what if we put one on the, the you know, like, yeah, get, the, get those not from the builder, mm -hmm. do it yourself. That's easy. Again, back yeah, to the I got canvas. Beautiful That's ones easy. that are like wide set. They look expensive. I spent yep. a couple hundred bucks and an evening with a $9 cabinet jig that I got on Amazon. Those, and those, those stupid cabinet jigs are the best because they line right the up best. and you just, zoop, zoop, <laughs> and, and you rock and roll. It's so I tell easy. everybody, like, if you're going to do it yourself, get the jig, spend the $9. Yep. It is infinitely it's worth it. I've done it both worth. ways. <laughs> yeah. Th same thing on door, like door handles. I'm 50, 50, like sometimes door handles, like actual door pulls are a little bit cheaper with the builder. If they have the exact one you want. Yeah. Um, I, I'm yeah, I'm 50, 50 there. I would say paint, like do not pay the builder to paint accent walls or secondary paint colors. Like they're going to, they're going to charge you for it. Like it's just, it's not worth. Yeah. It's not if they even it. allow it. Like, yeah. Even if they, if, if it's something they allow, we talked about the bathroom. I would say like your tile selection in your primary bathroom, spend the money on your primary, do your mm -hmm. secondary bathrooms yourself. Yeah. Like, like make your primary bathroom the way you want it within reason. Although um, I will say secondary bathrooms often you're not dealing with a ton of square footage. Right. So, I mean, the difference between standard tile and upgrade tile in a secondary bathroom, it might be like 50, a hundred bucks. Like to me, that's worth just going ahead and getting what you want in that case. Yeah. Well, and, and two, you kind of just got to do the math on like, hey, what is it? What is it going to cost me to finance this versus do I have this in my pocket, like to come up to do it after the fact, right? Because it, it's five thousand dollars financed, at least in my mind. Maybe I'm wrong. Five thousand dollars rolled into my mortgage versus five thousand dollars out of pocket out of close feels very different for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because like and I can, I can, yeah. Put that roll when that interest everything. rates were lower, it wasn't as big a deal to think about like, okay, I'm financing this cabinet hardware for 30 years. Yeah. But now the interest rates are a little bit higher. Affordability is more of an issue. I'd say think a little bit more carefully about what you're financing. Yep. This is what you can yep. just pay for up front. Yep. And we, we talked about carpet. One of the things I think that a lot of people don't talk about is uh, not just carpet, but carpet pad, like the, the mm. piece that goes underneath the carpet makes almost as big of a difference than like the carpet on top itself. Yeah. Like upgrading the pad is likely to, to feel more expensive than just upgrading the carpet. Yeah. You could have a cheaper top carpet, but have a nicer pad and it, and it'd be a win, at least in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Now I'm not a carpet person. I did no carpet in my whole house. We have allergies. We have pets. Mm. That is something like I have buyers that come in and they want that, but yep. that comes with a significantly higher price tag. We oh. gave up some of the structural options that we thought would be cool to have because we knew that the flooring was going to be such a big ticket item. Yep. Um, so just something to keep in mind that if that's what you want to do and you don't want any carpet, you're going to have to pay up front for it. And it's, it's going to be a big chunk of your upgrades. Yeah. I mean, like I did a design appointment last week. And so it was a four bed, two bath. It was like a 2,400 square foot house and they wanted to go no carpet. So they went LVP uh, and tile in the, like LVP everywhere. And yeah. that, and, and it was not even like a high end. It was like a mid tier with that builder. And it was like a $21,000 upgrade. Whoo. Yeah. So, no, I priced one out recently for about the same square footage for like a level one LVP and it was like 13, 14,000. So yeah, so it just depends on the builder and the material. But yeah, yeah, it was, it was like 21 with all of their flooring and it was like, oh, that got real expensive real quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when you're, we, we've talked about this a little bit before, but I always like, when you think about designing 12 to 15% of base price is probably a healthy margin. So like if you're looking at a home that has a base price, you know, around 400 and you figure you've got 12 to 15% on top of that, that probably puts you in a solid space in that neighborhood for all of your upgrades. Let me check that out. 
Is that right? Oh, like including structural options? Yeah, like including structural. So like at 400, at 400 That'd be 60,000. I just did the math because I don't trust my brain to do head math. <laughs> so 50, 15%, that would be like 60,000. Yeah. To, I mean, to me, that's a little on the high end, but it just depends on the builder. Yeah. Yeah. And the neighborhood and what you want to do. And again, how sure. you're planning on making those things happen. So it's not any, unreasonable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other things, save money, spend money with the builder. Oh, I'm yeah. A big, I was gonna say, I'm a big electrical person. Like I want to make sure I get all of my electrical right. So that's yeah. for me, that's like TV, you know, we have, we did TV plugs in all of our, our rooms to, mm -hmm. to have TVs mounted. Cause I didn't want to mess with that later. Added some extra plugs in the garage, Christmas light. So yeah. anything like electrical when you're building, uh, if the builder allows it, those are like, A, it can get kind of pricey kind of quick, um, but it's worth it's worth doing so that you're you know, not cutting the drywall. You know what I wish I had done? Hmm. Is actually like up lighting on the front exterior. Ooh. That's something we that feels like it would be really expensive to have to like, Mm -hmm. hammer through the stone and the, and the brick and everything like that just seems like that would be an expensive add on. Yeah. I'm like, I'm just going to do solar lighting, but my home face is North. So it gets very little sunlight in the front yeah. and it's weaker light. So I do wish that when I came home at night, my home was all lit up and pretty and like, maybe yeah. we'll do that later, but I wish we, we, we did the, we did the ones in the, uh, the soffits. Like yeah. that run and I, I and I like those, but I wish I would have done those plus up lighting. Like I think that would have looked yeah. really, really good. Um, I think if looking back on ours, a thing we wish we would have done is our plan had the option to to elevate the entryway. Uh, so we have a single story house, mm, and there was yeah. the option to like to to elevate. So our our ceilings I think are nine or ten, and it would have made our entryway you know twelve or whatever it was. Um, and that yeah, was something my wife means, really yeah. really wanted, but we. Well, again, we were being budget conscious, and we, so we traded our elevated entryway ceilings uh, for our covered patio. Is was was our trade off. Mm -hmm. so I wish we would have yeah. done that, and I wish I would have done eight foot doors. I love when I see houses with eight foot doors. Yeah. I love it, and I wish I would have done that. Well, if it makes you feel better, I don't think they're offered. I don't think Paysetter offers eight foot interior doors. They don't, but other Even other builders do. Huh? Other builders do, and I do love yeah. that. Yeah, uh, other builders do, and and you're not you're not limited by them anymore. So you can <laughs> offer that all over the place. <laughs> I can. Uh, okay, so okay. we talked about flex cash. We, I don't, I don't I mean we can talk about using it as a price reduction. I don't think that's the best use of your money, personally. It's not. So I don't want to give it a lot of lot of attention. Um, no, just just know that you can save probably hundreds of dollars more per month in using it to buy down the rate than you can by using it to buy down, buy down the price. Correct. So don't bother with that unless you're a cash buyer and you're just trying to get that, that purchase price lower. It's not really worth it. Okay. Um, let's do, let's do secret expenses. So like, uh, okay. any other things. So, so first one that comes to mind is we live in North Texas, uh, toll bills. Let's talk about mm -hmm. the, like, that that's a big deal when you consider where you're buying. Yes. And this is something like what we're going to talk about next is something that can apply to new construction or a pre-built home. It's uh -huh. a little bit more about the area that you choose to live in. So yeah, toll bills. I know at one point I was commuting from Ulysses to Frisco every day for work and my toll bill was 300 bucks a month. Oh, oh yeah. no. So oh. think about that in terms of, okay, if I'm buying in an area where I don't have to use the toll roads to get around all the time, like if you're off the 75 corridor and so instead of Dallas North Tollway, mm -hmm. then, okay, well now all of a sudden I can afford $300 more per month on my mortgage payment. Yeah. That's a lot well, of buying power. And that, and that's the hard part. I feel like is so many, like, as, as you go to the North side of the Metroplex, there's like, mm -hmm. you know, there's, you know, Dallas North Tollway, there's George Bush, there's the 635 double corridor thingy that I, I got <laughs> on that the other day. Like I almost got on it the other day, but the, it was the variable rate and it was like 750. And I was like, I can't, I just, I can't no. make myself pay that. I'm going to sit in traffic. So I did it once yeah. when I was running late and it was kind of cool, but yeah, it gets pricey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. you know you know just drive and close your eyes until they send you the bill but i think i think that's a hard thing too for a lot of people especially as we have 
have conversations with people relocating into North Texas and everybody that's wanting to be, you know, to the North or to, to the Northeast. Like that's always one of those conversations I want to have is like, Hey, just FYI, you're going to have toll bills. So we need mm -hmm. to calculate that in your monthly expenses. Yeah. Another thing is going to be like for us, when we moved from an apartment to a house, we were able to get rid of our storage unit Ooh. that my husband had for his business. So our floor plan had a three car tandem garage as an option. Mm -hmm. And we were able to move everything from the storage unit to that third bay of the garage. And that saved us over a hundred bucks a month from Love being it. able to get rid of the storage unit. So think of these ways that like, okay, I'm going to have these expenses that I don't have to pay for anymore, which increases my buying power when it comes to purchasing a new home. Right. But you also, we've also got to add the expenses of, you know, potentially an HOA. Most, mm -hmm. most new communities, at least that I've seen are, have some sort of HOA attached to them. I've seen Me them too. everything from 300 a year to 1500 a year, depending on location amenities that you're getting. Uh, so you've got to kind of factor that in as well. well and some of them even offer services. So yeah. Find out what the HOA covers. Sometimes it also covers lawn care. Sometimes it covers internet. So you want to make sure that you have all of the information to be able to do those calculations. Because it right. might be like, hey, this uh, this HOA bill seems really high, but it's including one gig fiber. Front yard maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're like, okay, well, there's a hundred bucks a month that I'm not going to have to pay on an internet bill because it's included in the HOA or that I'm not going to have to spend on landscapers if you're somebody who's going to hire a landscaper. So that's another yeah. thing. If you're like, you know what? I'd rather do that myself. I don't want to live in an HOA where the front yards are maintained. Then that'll drive where you want to look at to live. Yeah. And I, I think the important part of this conversation, I think that that's hard for a lot of people is you have to be like, there's a difference between being a mortgage payer and being a homeowner. Like, don't mm -hmm. just be somebody that just pays your, like, you own this asset, right? Like, you have a controlling interest in the asset. So it's your job to take care of it. And for a lot of people, you know, when they buy for the first time, it's like, oh, I don't have a landlord to call or a company. To, like, it's like, it's you. You have to, mm -hmm. to take care of the asset. You have to, you know, change the air filters. You have to, you know, water the grass. You have to, uh, you know, drain the, the hot water heater once a quarter. Make sure it's like, stays functional. There's, there's things that are going to come up and you probably need to have built into your budget, I don't know, half a percent, a percent, a year of purchase price for like just home maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all of those things rolled in. And like I said, I think you, I think that's the mentality for a lot of people is you have to get in the space of like, oh, I own this. Like I should be, I'm taking care of it. And there's costs associated with me taking care of uh, protecting this asset. Yeah. And the good news is that historically, the value of that asset goes up year over year. Yes. The, the 100 year national average is 4% every year that your home will increase in value. So if you're saving half a percent or a percent a year to set aside for maintenance, well, you're getting more than that back in the value of that asset. And in the yeah. meantime, your home is a nicer place to live. And it's yours. And it's yours. And so I think, I think the last one I want to hit, because I think this is an important one is property taxes. And I want to, and I want to talk about it from two different standpoints. One, if you are like, if you're listening and you are not in Texas and you're really relocating here and you know, Texas is, is, is one of the things you're considering, I would tell you, a, you know, we don't pay any state income taxes, which is awesome. But on the transitional side of that, we do pay property taxes. And if you're not prepared for them, you will have a significant sticker shock in your property taxes. I'm talking some on average here in DFW, we're anywhere between 1.9 and 3.1% of assessed value for your property taxes, which gets yeah. to be very pricey, very quick. That will be added into the expenses of your mortgage. So it's not abnormal to see six to $800 a month for property taxes, right? I don't know about what yeah. else is. But and I have people else. that have sticker shock just, just moving from more rural parts of Texas that are outside mm -hmm. of DFW. And they're like, oh, I'm only paying like 500 bucks a year for, for taxes. And you're like, well, no, no, that's no, not here. Not in the Metroplex. So the other, the other sticker shock on that piece too, is if you're buying, particularly buying new construction, make sure when you set up your escrow account with your lender, make sure that they collect the taxes based on the improved value, not just mm -hmm. the value of the land. So what, what I mean by that is, so when you the property taxes are assessed year over year, 
Um, and the county, before there's a house built on that, you're, they're only assessing the value of the land. So it's a you know thirty thousand dollar piece of land or fifty, whatever the number is. And so you're paying taxes based on that. And so mm -hmm. if you buy, like let's say you close in the middle of 2024, well the tax bill that's due at the end is only based on the value of the unimproved land because there was not a structure when they assessed it. The next mm -hmm. year you're going to pay taxes on the improved structure. So where and they're automatically going to do that. What's not what is not automatic is making sure the lender sets up your escrow account the correct way. I've seen too many times where people have said, "Oh yeah, it's really great," and we set it up, and they have this low payment, and then eight months later they get hit with a shortage, and it's like your payment went up a thousand dollars a month, and like we don't know what happened. It's like well they didn't they didn't do the correct assessment on your taxes to set you up the right way. I think that's another tick in the favor of using one of the builder's lenders Yep. Uh, because they are experienced new construction and they know about that. And the vast majority of them will go ahead and include that in the numbers that they're setting up for you. Correct. And to be fair, it's sure. still, <laughs> it's still going to fluctuate a little bit that, you know, they're guessing and they're mm -hmm. estimating, but I would much rather it fluctuate 50 to a hundred dollars than a thousand dollars plus. Yeah, hundred percent. So, all right. I think we, we've hit a lot on money and savings, and uh, we'll, we'll close it up and wrap it up, and just tell you, hey, if you're if you are moving to DFW or you are here in DFW uh, and you have questions about new construction, Megan and I would love to help, and cannot wait to get you into that next home. So, thanks for hanging out with us today. If you missed any other episodes, go back and check them out. We'll see you in our next one next Friday for the next episode. Bye, guys. Right. Bye.